one. The director of an engineering company is interviewing an applicant for a job. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Ah, good morning. It's Mr. Robinson, isn't it? Have a seat, Stephen Robinson. Yes. Is that S T E V E N or P H? It's V. Okay, I've got your letter of application, but I need a few more details for the file. Now you're from Manchester. What exactly is the address? Yes, it's Dynevor Gardens. That's D Y N E V O R. The Presswich. Thanks. And telephone? Well, it isn't mine. It's the landlord's, but I can be contacted. It's four eight three two five zero. The landlord lives in, does he? Well, he has the flat downstairs, and he's a friend of the family, anyway. I see. Okay. According to your letter, I imagine you were born in. Uh, let me see. Nineteen sixty. Sixty-one. Right. And the date? Twelfth of July. Thank you. And I believe you're married. No, no, I'm getting married, but not for a few months. Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, congratulations. Is it going to be in Manchester? Well, no, actually, my fiance is from Wales, so we're getting married in her home village near Bangor. Oh, how nice! Now, as you know, when you apply for a post with Williams Engineering, we need to find out a few things about both your academic background and more recent work experience. The latter being especially important in respect of this rather specialised position in the area of water management. First of all, A levels. Yes, I've got three: geography, maths, and physics. Geography, maths, and physics. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. And what about your degree? I went to Sheffield University and got an engineering degree with water management as my specialisation. Ah,、huh? and as for work experience, I started out after graduating in 1986 in China, working for the Chinese government. Did you work as a volunteer? No, I, I did get a nominal salary. It was a two-year irrigation project.、That、sounds fascinating. How did you organise that? You say it wasn't a British company then? No, no. My university had links with a Chinese engineering university, so it was organised at that level. And after that, then I came back, moved to Manchester, and have been working with Latimer Engineering since then. And what exactly are you doing for Latimer? Oh, I'm working in irrigation again. This time as a project research assistant. Great. I've got your details. Now let's move on to a more general discussion about what we're looking. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Tom. Hello, Anne. What have you been doing? Oh, just sitting around, catching up with some reading. I've had a great time. You know we're doing this assignment on... what is it? Museums, their costs and benefits. That's <laughs> right. Well, I've been to the Sandgate Museum. It was really good. These local museums are really interesting because they connect people with the history of one special place. We all know about kings and emperors and battles and wars, but local museums tell us about the everyday lives of ordinary people, and that's why they are so important. I'm not so sure about that. I think they are of interest, but they're so small that they can't give a true picture. They do their best. I don't really agree. They do give a true picture, but perhaps not a full picture. It's the truth, but not the whole truth. I think the smallness is the number one problem. Because they're small and local, they attract few visitors. That's why they have so little money. And because they have little money, they can't buy or maintain many really interesting exhibits. As a result, the shop is almost as big as the museum to try to raise money by selling souvenirs, postcards, sweets and so on. I think they find it difficult, but not impossible. And don't forget, they get a lot of their exhibits free from local people. There was this boat, for example, that was fantastic. Really? What was that? There was a massive fishing boat, a real one, about a hundred years old, and you could walk on it and get the feeling of what fishing in those days was really like. Hmm, sounds quite good. Hmm. But I've always found that these kinds of museums are a bit dingy. For example, the display cabinets are so dark that you can hardly see the exhibits, and the labels are sometimes difficult to read. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So coming back to our assignment, what we've got to decide is whether these museums should be funded by the government or just by local people. I think it depends entirely on what kind of museum it is. How do you mean? Well, take local history museums. They are small, so they won't survive without financial support. But that should come from the local authority, hmm. since only people in that area or tourists will visit it. I agree, but what about big natural history museums? Surely they should get money from the central government. Why? Children who want to learn about nature can go out into the countryside with their school teachers. Hmm. They could survive from donations, and they get loads of visitors anyway. The state should spend more on science museums since not enough people are studying science these days. Mm, I'm not so sure, but I do think a sort of museum which should not get public funds is the craft museum. Yes, like museums of cotton weaving. Yeah, which are of interest to only a very small number of people, and they should pay for it. I agree, but a working farm is a different thing again. Mm. That's something from the past of all of us, and so it's important to the local community. Kids can learn a lot, too. That's the sort of thing that the local government should be spending its money on. Yes, I agree. Well, I think we've got plenty of ideas for our assignment. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. Part 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, what was it like in your school then, Lynn? Well, South African schools are very different from schools in Australia. For a start, children don't start their schooling until they are seven, quite a bit later than schools in Australia. What about New Zealand, Gail? We're more like Australia. I can't believe children don't go to school until they are seven. When do the parents get any free time? Well, there's still the availability of kindergartens or play schools. It's just that formal education doesn't start until later. I don't think it's such a good idea for children to have to be too academic at such a young age. They should be able to just enjoy themselves. Well, yeah, but the first school children go to isn't really very academic. It's just an opportunity for children to learn a few basic social skills by playing and learning with other children. Yes, I'd agree with that. I guess being so close, Australian and New Zealand schools must be similar then. Well, I suppose they do share a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. For example, children in New Zealand go through intermediate school, but in Australia there's only high school. That's right, isn't it, Pat? Yeah, I think so. What about South Africa, Lynn? Do you have an intermediate or high school? Oh, high school. And now the difference between Australian and New Zealand education is that although both countries have state schools and private schools... Our private schools are very often run by religious groups, whereas New Zealand schools are secular. That's not true. There are quite a few religious schools in New Zealand. Oh, OK, maybe we are similar. Only a few South African schools have any religious connection, so I guess we're different. Most people go to state schools. Pat, is it true that some people from your country don't have to go to school at all? Well, that's partly true. Because of the geography of Australia, there are a lot of children who do not have access to schools, at least on a regular basis. Instead, they have a form of correspondence education where the lessons are actually on the radio and the students send their work in by post. That way they get a lot of what they would if they were in the classroom, apart from the interaction. In New Zealand, not all students have to go to school either. Some parents have opted for homeschooling. Oh, is that like correspondence teaching? We don't really have that. Well, we do have correspondence schools, but homeschooling is different. With homeschooling, the parents teach the children and set them homework. They have to present a syllabus to their local education authority before they can do that, but it is becoming a more popular choice for some parents. I suppose it also suits parents' own commitments. I mean, they don't have to worry about collecting their children from school, and they can always teach over the weekend or in the evening if they want to. Is the school day normally quite long, then? Not in New Zealand, but I think it can be in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I think Australia is unusual in that there are extracurricular activities which you have to go to. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. These are normally sport activities, but there are a few other options. We have activities after school for any student that is interested, but they aren't compulsory. What about in New Zealand, Gail? I had to do some sport every week. I didn't really like it, but it was part of the school day, so I guess that's not so bad. Anyway, I spent two years at boarding school, so things were a little different. Boarding school? What was that like? Well, the thing I remember most about it was the strict dress code. There were restrictions on everything. You had to wear a school uniform almost all of the time, and it had to be cleaned and ironed. The length of your skirt had to be no less than one inch above your knees when kneeling down. Sometimes we used to go out on school trips or just at weekends with a few friends. But whenever we were outside the school, we had to wear a hat. There was one teacher who always used to give me extra homework because my socks weren't pulled up. 
and that was in the school late in the evening. I suppose it wasn't that bad, but at the time it felt like a prison. I kept getting into trouble for something. Most of the time I forgot something, normally my school badge. We had to wear that all the time, in the school and out, because it had our house colours on it. Wow, that doesn't sound like much fun. No, but it was a good education, I suppose. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. I've asked you here just to remind you about this Friday's field trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. OK, I'd like to keep this meeting as brief as possible, as I'm sure we all have things to do. I've asked you here just to remind you about this Friday's field trip. This is the first of many field trips you'll be going on, so there are a few rules I'd like to make clear now. Most importantly, I want you all to remember that simply because you are leaving the college does not mean that you are not studying. This is an essential part of your course and should be treated as such. There will be two assignments for you to complete whilst you are there and some extension work you will be expected to do over the weekend, so I suggest you all pay attention on the day. Moving on, remember that we are going to a salt marsh and must dress appropriately. High-heeled shoes and t-shirts are not what I consider appropriate. You need good footwear, preferably with boots, and you should bring a waterproof jacket as the weather is unpredictable. It would also be a good idea to bring a change of clothes. There is a chance you will get wet, and a three-hour return journey in damp clothes is nobody's idea of fun. We will be on the marsh from about ten o'clock to about four, so you will be given a light lunch. However, if you want to bring any snacks with you, then please feel free to do so although we will be stopping for dinner on the way home. Now this is the fourth time the college has been to Park Drive Salt Marsh, and so far we have never lost a student. <laughs> However, remember that there are 28 people going, and if you are late, you will be keeping myself and your colleagues waiting, and at that time in the morning you will not find me very forgiving. Please try to arrive a few minutes before seven. If you are not here on the hour, you risk being left behind. For those of you who are being collected in the evening, you can expect to be back here between 8.30 and 9pm. But do warn whoever may be coming for you that the traffic is unpredictable and it may well be later. Before you go, I'll hand out your assignment papers and briefly explain what you have to do. Now, on the first page, all you are required to do is identify the flora and fauna on the page and find an example in the salt marsh. As I told you on Monday, you will need a camera for this. I recommend one of those disposable cameras rather than something more valuable, as the marsh can get very dirty. Now on page 2, you will be looking more at the bird life on the marsh. You should be able to see what you have to do for this assignment but there will be plenty of time on the way there to ask any other questions. Well, we'll stop there, and I'll see you all on Friday morning. Oh, before you go, just a word of caution. The plants are there to be seen and photographed only. Remember that this is a protected site, and we will have to get permission for this trip. 
If there are any problems, we may not be allowed to go again, and you will be spoiling the opportunity for other students. OK, if you have any questions, come and see me later today or tomorrow. That is the end of part four.